Welcome to the festive episode. But what to do? Always a quandary. Now, here in the UK, snow is linked to the festive season, despite it very rarely snowing during the period. Cards, pictures, movies, decorations, all connected with snow. And this got me thinking. Let's check out some games linked to snow and ice. Brilliant! The first one then is Bobsleigh. Now you can't get much cooler than that. Bobsleigh was released by Digital Integration in 1985 and endorsed by Britain's number one driver. Um, not sure what that says actually. Looking at the names of the teams from the Winter Olympics 1984 and none of them seem to match the signature. I'm sure someone will come up with it at some point. Inside and we get the race manual and what the hell is this? Yes, it's copy protection. Oh dear. Ah, but here's the man himself, Nick Phipps. The mystery is solved. Onto the game then and it looks more like a simulation really, but it does have a lot of features. Many courses, all with maps in the manual. Ah, protection, okay, right. Ooh, 1 to 8k music please. Right, first you rock backwards and forwards, and then run like hell, and then jump in, and we're off. Heading down the track. Leaning into those corners. This is quite good actually. Ooh, a nasty crash there. Let's try again. I like the feeling of speed. Now, do you use those banks to get extra speed or just a... Ah, oh, crash. Right. Another go then. I must finish this course at least. You run for the first 50 metres and then have to get in before that. Otherwise, you get disqualified. Then it's off into the icy drain pipe. The controls work well, although without a joystick, you'll be using the cursor keys. The feeling of movement is good, as I've said before, and the sound works well, even though it's just a lot of white noise. I like this game, and I didn't think I would, to be honest. You feel you want to do better each time, and improve your score. Doing well will earn you money to upgrade things. Crashing will lose you money because you need to repair your bobsleigh. Yes, it's a simulation, but the arcade element of hurtling down the track is great. Yay, I finished the course. Oh, and got disqualified. Right, damn. I need to do better so I can start upgrading things. Anyway, let's move on. Still on the theme of ice then, and this is Freezebees released by Silversoft in 1984. Now this is a version of the arcade game Bengo, and a damn difficult version if you ask me. It has some nice jolly tunes, decent graphics and good sound, but it's just too hard. Or am I just a bad game player? You have to push the ice cubes into the chasing monsters. Some of the ice cubes hide the monsters, and if you can get those, you get extra points. But wow, it's tough. And this is on the slowest speed too. The control works well, but it really doesn't help me. It's a simple game concept, as are many of the early arcade titles. A 
like they could have gently eased you in, but no. Nasty chasing enemies and quick deaths. The main problem, apart from the rapid direction change of the monsters, is that if you get stuck between two blocks and you can't push them, you can't move in time to get away from the monsters, which is quite annoying and a bit frustrating. This is tough, and I'm not sure it's something I want to play over the festive season. It just gets a bit, well, frustrating really. again. I think we should move on to something more relaxing. What was happening 38 years ago in December 1984? Well, let's take a look through the Christmas issue of Popular Computing Weekly and find out. The main news covered three things. New machines planned by Acorn, the MSX Price Wars and a BT Mole. The new BBC B Plus is expected to sell for £400, and the BBC C30 for £500. Quite hefty price tags for something trying to compete with Sinclair's machines. MSX machines are seeing a price crash in an urgent effort to grab some of the lucrative Christmas market. The prices though are still going to be far too high to compete with the likes of Sinclair and Commodore. Talking of Commodore, they're also set to release two new micros, the Commodore 128, which as the name suggests will have 128k of RAM, in two banks and be launched at the Consumer Electronics Show Las Vegas. This will have two versions, one featuring twin disk drives and both models are expected to be available in the UK by April 1985. Now the news that caught my eye was the BT Mole. This is a juicy story about an alleged hacking of several mail accounts within Prestel. BT closed down the accounts of a company called Teleframe as they suspected employees of that company were leaking passwords to accounts of other organisations. Timeframe denied the allegations and were taking legal action until BT backtracked and reinstated the accounts. It seems someone sent emails to various people under the name BT Mole. The messages included account IDs and passwords from BT Gold accounts and terminal access codes. The hackers were using a VTX 5000 modem linked to a Spectrum. It later transpired that the accounts that were supposedly hacked didn't actually have passwords, so not really a hack then. In other news, the Thurnell disk drive system for the Spectrum has been upgraded with better and more reliable 3-inch disk drives. The disk system itself costs £219.95, so it's a bit of an expensive add-on. Continuing with Sinclair and the fabled electric car, codenamed the C5, will be on sale in January, and it will sell for around the same price as a QL, that's £400. It will have a top speed of 15 miles per hour and a range of only 24 miles, so it's expected to be used for commuting and leisure. Sinclair also saying they will not reduce the price of microdrive cartridges, despite the request from users. They originally said earlier in the year they would reduce them from the current 495, but now say they have no plans to do so. Moving on, and Breakdance 2. Believe in the beat, it's back on the street. Electric boogaloo, yay! Such an 80s advert. Airwolf, a great TV series and an average game though. Nice advert from Elite who beat Ocean to the license, even though Ocean had put out a few adverts themselves. I could never play this game. I could never get past this wall thing, despite trying numerous times. Eventually it became boring, so I gave up. Pity the show's music is not included, like the 64 version, but strangely, the 64 version of the game is different to the specy one. Skipping forward and we get the year in review. Sinclair announced its new business machine, the QL, in January, featuring 128K of RAM, a 32-bit processor, and everyone was excited and hoped it would be compatible with the Spectrum. It wasn't. CRL tied up a deal to produce the video game of War of the Worlds and made a fair old mess of it, and Jack Tramiel quit Commodore amid rumours of boardroom splits. February brought the old 8-bit wars back with Commodore reporting it would combat Sinclair's QL with their own upgraded machine, the Commodore 256. Dragon Data stumbled, but were still heading for a fall. And the Ministry of Defence stepped in to stop a man selling his own technology that stopped tape copying. In March, Timex withdrew from the US market. Sinclair still hadn't shipped the QL, and Imagine Software got entangled in legal battles with Marshall Cavendish. In April, 
Amstrad promised us the CPC-464, and companies started to sell off stocks of Dragon 32s at discount prices, some as low as £88. Something was amiss at Dragon Data. The QL arrived, but with bits of the ROM hanging out of the case at the back. It seems Sinclair just couldn't fit them inside, and didn't want to delay things any further, so they put them in a small plastic box and stuck them to the back. May saw the ZX printer getting decent discounts. It was a good time to grab one if you wanted one. Boots threatened to drop the Dragon 32 machine, following on from British home stores. And Wall's ice cream produced a lolly named the Megabyte. Mmm, talk about jumping on the bandwagon. June and Dragon Data went into receivership, as did Carnell Software. July saw Dractramel buying a tariff for a cool $240 million. Imagine Software ceased to be... Dragon Data was sold to a company in Spain, and Microdeal got caught in a legal battle with Activision about their game Cuthbert in the Jungle. Apparently, it was too similar to Pitfall. August and 16K Spectrum ceased to be produced. A sad day. September and the MSX story keeps on moving, with various companies claiming to be working on machines adhering to the standard. Not many actually made it, though. Automata released Deus Ex Machina, something the likes of we have never seen before. October and Oryx seem to be suing everyone. Commodore announced their Commodore 128 machine. And Ocean shipped Frankie Goes to Hollywood, without the actual license deal being signed. But it all turned out well in the end, well, apart from the game. Sinclair launched the Spectrum Plus with the QL-style keyboard. And in November, Mastertronic got into hot water with its new game Chiller. Apparently one Michael Jackson was not happy about the soundtrack. And finally December, and here we are. So. Let's move on. The reviews. Tower of Despair from Games Workshop gets a good review. The adventure itself is exciting, they say, calling for both logical thought and the involvement of real role-playing. This quilled adventure joined the many others that were being released at this time. And like so many of them, the font was often difficult to read. It scored 4 out of 5. Pitfall 2 starts with a rather nice introduction. Among all the willies, wilfs and wallies, this could be another Tom, Dick, or in this case, Pitfall Harry. Very nice. They pointed out a bug that when using balloons it could lead to the game being stuck and having to be reloaded, and as such scored it 3 out of 5. School Days also gets a mention and a good review. They like the uniqueness, the attention to detail, and how you can add your names to the teachers, and it gets an impressive 5 out of 5. There were also reviews for Zanny King Jr. and Sim Salabim for the 64, Fruit Machine for the CPC, and a few others. Here's an interesting advert for the Saiga Emperor keyboard with a Spectrum already fitted for £177.50. I didn't even know this was offered anywhere. There's a few more adverts. Backpacker's Guide, always loved the image on that one. And Monty's Innocent. Lancelot gets a full page, as does Ram Electronics. And Castle of Terror from Melbourne House. On to a favourite of mine and Tony Bridges' Adventure Corner. I always read this. This one starts, though, with some weird preamble. A story. A story that sort of gets what he wants to say across in a weird adventure-type way. Taking up the character and eventually covering the games, both good and bad, that have appeared over the last few years. I really don't like the way this is written, though, and prefer his usual style. Peek and Poke has nothing of interest other than this question about upgrading the 16K Spectrum. After previously buying my children a Sinclair Spectrum 16K in December 1982, I have been disappointed at their lack of interest, it says. They say it is outdated and that all the games they have, or borrowed, are 48K. To help rekindle their interest, and mine, could you please advise? Do we sell it and buy a BBC? What is the best way to upgrade to 48K? What are the best and most useful add-ons? And can we upgrade the machine past 48K? The answer is, I sympathise with your problem. The 16K machine has always suffered from a lack of software, and indeed, could be said to be outdated due to its limited memory capacity. I will try to answer your questions one by one, blah de blah de blah. I would not sell and buy a BBC, firstly because the second-hand market for 16K Spectrums is not good, and secondly because the software you have already bought will be wasted. The simplest way to upgrade a 48K is to buy a 32K RAM pack, Either that, or use your brain and read the magazines for adverts, fool. From your point of view, it continues, the best add-ons would seem to be those which will assist game playing. I would recommend a programmable joystick, such as that manufactured by Cambridge Computing. And it goes on, 
as far as upgrading the machine past 48k? The answer is, yes it can be, but what's the point? There is very little software that will make use of it. A fine answer then, and I hope he took the advice. Skipping past the classifieds, although looking at the price for second-hand spectrums, we see that they're similar to eBay today. The top 10 for Christmas then, and the usual suspects, Daily Thompson at number 1. It's weird that World Cup from Arctic, a terrible game, comes in at number 5. But apart from that, all the other games are somewhat classic. The new releases then, what can we buy right now? The Illustrator, adding graphics to the Quill, Space Shuttle from Activision, and Airwolf from Elite. We've covered that, so let's skip to the end. Well, almost. The back cover has a great Automata cartoon. Now, did you notice the front cover offered a free calendar? I wonder how many of those survived. Well, mine did. Here it is. It's only a six-month calendar, for some reason, with plenty of adverts around the outside. Microgen having to dig at pirates, and there are plenty of small retailers grabbing some space here. We did miss one thing out though, typings. This magazine has four of them for the Spectrum, and none of them are available online. One was a simple data loader, and the other three though, well, let's see. Here's the first one, Christmas Holly by E. Duncan Dunlop. This short listing uses the plot and draw commands to draw Holly on your screen. How nice. Let's just take a few minutes to relax. The next one is Sleigh Ride, or as the listing calls it, Santa, written by Peter Miller. Another relatively short listing, with lots of user-definable graphics, and a tune. Easy to type out, and they only had to add one extra line that clears the bit of screen at the end. Here it is, you have to wait for the third run. Well, on to the last one then, and you can probably guess what this is. It's called Carol, but there's no author attributed to it. You type it out, and it plays several Christmas carols. And there it is. This is probably the first time that these programs have been seen in over 30 years, in fact 38 years, and they will be available to download from my website shortly. There are some times when I feel the need to deep dive into a game. This can be for various reasons, but mainly because I'm planning to do a rewrite or sequel. Other times I'm just messing about and find something interesting, like a hidden code or message. Lesser known games can be quirky or downright frustrating, and some are just so bad they deserve to be lost forever. One such game is Summer Santa, released by Alpha Omega Software in 1986. Why is it so bad, you ask? Well, let me explain in great detail. Summer Santa is a game with a festive theme, obviously, but to me feels more like a game that was rushed out. There are so many things in it that just don't work and don't make sense. I'll be using an infinite lives poke to demonstrate to make it easier for myself. But let's take a look at the game map first. Here it is. And yes, it's a small game, containing only eight rooms. Not too difficult to play then, so you might think. The idea is that you have to deliver presents, one at a time, to the various socks around the map. This involves getting the present from the toy box first by jumping into the lever on the ceiling, and this opens it up so you can collect them. There are only four socks, so an easy task. But that does not in itself complete the game. Bottom left shows the percentage complete, but we'll come on to that later. 
The game has a few mechanics to learn, the main one being the use of levers. Right, let's start then. On the first screen, a rather drab grotto, Sand has to jump into the lever and open the toy box. Then we can go down to the toy box, but walking into it does nothing. Nothing at all. And you have to work out for yourself that you actually have to jump into the box to be able to collect the present. And when you do, a small present appears here at the bottom of the screen. Now the label says presents, but you can only ever carry one at a time. Santa seems to be a bit of a weakling. Now we have a present, we can exit this screen, and to do this we drop down here. As we appear on the roof, we instantly get killed by dogs if we try to move left. So to avoid these, we move right first. Now onto this screen, and we can see a sock at the far right. Why would a sock be there? It, anybody's guess. Anyway, we jump over the dog and get to the sock. But nothing happens when you walk into it. And yes, you have to jump into it again, just like you did with a toy box. This will deposit the present and earn you some points. Now, looking at the map, how do we get back to the grotto then? And no, you can't jump from the top room. You get killed by those birds. So, there's no way back. But wait, this is another bad feature of the game. You can jump through the floors of the screen. Yes, that's right. So, to get back to the grotto, we have to get back to the rooftops. And now we have to navigate past those two dogs. To do this, as soon as the screen changes, you instantly jump left. And then when you land, you instantly jump again. And then when you land again, you instantly jump again. That's three instant jumps to get you to this part. It's tricky, but once you get used to it, it can become second nature. Now you have to jump onto the chimney, and then jump up, and, as if by magic, you're back in the grotto. Now we can grab another present. This thing with jumping through floors is used in other places too, and not always by design. But we'll come onto that when we reach the rooms. Nothing points to this in the game or in the graphics, so really you just had to guess this for yourself. Notice the bad collision detection here when dropping down to the toy box. Nice. Now armed with another present, we have to head back into this room. So it's a quick dash to the left, across the roof with the two dogs, and then drop down into this room. Now we can deposit the present in the sock, and again you have to jump into it to make it work. no idea what happened there, I just happened to accidentally jump onto the bed and jump up, and it took me up a screen. Oh dear. The inlay claims that we have to creep around and avoid waking the sleeping residents, but you can jump on the bed and even the people's heads, and they don't even wake up. So what was the point in putting that on the inlay, if it doesn't appear in the game? Anyway, let's carry on. Now we need another present. So it's back to the grotto, but how do we do it because we're now in this room without any way to get back to where we need to, if that makes any sense. And what you have to do is drop down into the room with the man that's walking about, and jumping over him is tricky. You can try and use the table, and at some point you do have to get under the table to collect the glass that's there, and this is another element of game which I'll come onto shortly. The trick is to jump onto the chair first, and then jump over the man as he approaches, and this will give you a clear run to get to the other side and out. Right, onto the object on the table. Yes, it's a glass, and part of the game is that you have to collect and or drink all of the sherry. And this can be found in various rooms, as you can see on the map. The only problem is, you can't just walk into them to collect them. You have to jump into them. Yes, that weird way of collecting things and dropping things again. Right, we're now into the kitchen, and there is only one route back to the grotto. Yes, it's the famous magic jump through floor trick. So we have to jump onto these tiny shelves. Yes, they're shelves. And it's sometimes annoying to get there, but eventually you'll get the hang of it. When you get to the top one, you jump left, and then jump up, and it brings you into the familiar room. Now from here we can just go back up, across the rooftops, avoid the dog, avoid the other two dogs, jump onto the chimney, and back into the grotto. Whew. 
we collect another present and work our way back into the kitchen. Now looking at the map we have two choices. We can either go up the chimney, but I think we'll leave that until the last, or we can go down the trapdoor. To do this you have to jump over the coffee pot, jump onto the tiny shelves, jump up and trigger that lever. Yes, it's a lever. Pure guesswork again. It could have been anything. And this opens the trapdoor. Now we can move across, back over the coffee pot, and drop down into the cellar. Moving right and dropping down allows us to deposit the present into the sock. More points and more percentage complete. Excellent. Now, how do you get back? Ah, tricky. There's no way out of this room. So what you have to do is you have to trigger another lever. Yes, that thing on the right is a lever, but you can't trigger it by jumping up from below. You have to drop down through it. Right, that means you have to complete the most difficult jump in the game. It's almost impossible to get the timing right. You have to wait at the edge of the gap and try and jump over that ghost so that you land on the ladder, do another jump, run and then drop down through the lever. As I've said, this requires pixel perfect jumping and anything else will just kill you and it gets very annoying very quickly. Even when I was doing this with infinite lives, it took me about 25 goes before I managed it. Eventually though, you'll do it if you don't give up in pure frustration. You can then run across, drop down and operate the lever. And now a secret door opens on the left. So we just run along there, jump up onto the barrels, which accidentally embeds you in the wall. You jump up and into the left-hand side of the cellar. Don't worry about the skeleton, it's completely harmless. Now, as you can see, the only thing in here are three wine glasses. However, the jump mechanic, the collision detection and the position of the platforms makes it quite tricky to get to them. Eventually though, after bouncing around and dropping down, you collect them all and can get back. Now, also in this room, you will see a lever. This does absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. And I've tried triggering this with and without a present, when the game's completed, and more. But anyway. Once you've grabbed all the glasses, you head out again. Top right, and this takes you back into the right-hand side of the cellar. Now, here, the ladder has been magically extended, allowing you to get back. And it's got nothing to do with the lever, by the way, because I've tried it with and without doing it, so... Yeah, a completely unused part of the game. Right, jumping up through the ladder will take you into the kitchen. And from here, obviously, we can now get back to the rooftop, jumping up through the shelves, jumping through the floor, avoiding the dog, avoiding the two dogs, and back into the grotto. Phew, still with us? Good, there's only one more present to deliver. Once you get the last present, we head back down into the kitchen, and it's now time to climb up the chimney. Notice here that Santa can walk through the fire without getting harmed. Yes, Santa is fireproof. Now there's a trick to getting up the chimney. If you go all the way to the right, you can't jump onto the bricks because the game won't let you. What you have to do is walk a little bit to the left and then jump so that you're embedded completely in the wall. If you embed yourself halfway in the wall, what will happen is when you get halfway up the chimney, you'll fall down. The collision detection just doesn't work. Right, so let's try again. Move to the left a bit, jump right, so I'm completely embedded, and now I can work my way all the way up to the top and the final room. Now you can just jump into the room and deposit the final present. Notice that we still haven't got 100% yet. That's because we haven't drunk all of the sherry. 
There's one remaining, and that can be found to the left of the kitchen. Drop down the chimney and into the kitchen and go back up into this room. Now you can try and jump over the pans, but it's far easier just to jump up through the ceiling, move and then drop down again. Right, on to the final thing. You have to jump over this thing, which can be quite tricky. And you can't just walk into the glass to collect it, remember? You have to jump into it. So jumping into it will cause a delay, which means you get killed. I found it easy to jump left first and then jump right, and then finally collect the final glass. And yes, we have 100%. Right, nothing's happened. Mm. Okay, so head back to the grotto. Notice that moving out of this room corrupts the percentage score as well. Oh dear, things are looking bad already. Onto the shelves, up through the ceiling, across the roof, and into the grotto. And nothing happens. Okay, you can also pick up another present, but there's no way to drop it, because remember, the game is 100% complete now. I went down to the treasure chest in the cellar, Still nothing. Tried to use the lever. Still nothing. So we've managed to complete 100% of the game. Excellent. For what? Well, absolutely nothing other than the pleasure of doing it. As I was trying to find out if I could do anything else, I jumped into various rooms and tried to do strange things. I jumped onto the lampshade here and the game froze. It just stopped. The end. That's it. Can't do anything more. Right. Now the game, as mentioned at the start, was published by Alpha Amiga Software. But here's the best bit. That company was part of CRL. Now that explains everything. Now I can hear you all shouting, don't complain about a game if you can't do better yourself. Well, I can, and I did. I rewrote the entire game. I redrew the sprites, built the map, added music, and even extended it. So here for your delectation is Summer Santa 2022 edition. <laughs> The game is much less frustrating to play, just what you need over the festive season. All the rooms are in the same place, the socks are in the same place, the glasses are in the same place, and the gameplay is the same, and much more pleasurable to play. I've stopped the jumping up through floors routine, and to get back to the grotto, I've added two rooms to the left, and here there are extra glasses to collect, and a ladder which takes you to the rooftop. The game is free to download from my website now. Consider it a present from me to you. So on today's show, we thought with a bigger Christmas special, we'll go back and talk about comments that have been added to other Christmas specials. Righty-ho, seen as the, the other comment section that we did seemed quite popular, so why not do a Christmas one? Yeah, a lot of the comments are just wishing mostly you, but sometimes both of us, a very happy or merry Christmas. Some people, and it's quite clever, do things like, say, Merry ZXmas, which I quite oh, yes. like, and Merry Specmus, which okay. is always pretty good. You you also, actually, an interesting thing as well is people people sometimes say where they're from, but they seem to do it more Christmas, such as I'm from Australia, or I think there's one saying I'm from South Africa. South Africa, wow. Yeah. So episode 112, which was a Christmas special. Um, I don't know, do you want to talk briefly about Christmas specials? It's something that... Um, I try to do if I've got enough time. Mm. It's just a matter of... It's either going to replace an existing episode, as it is this year, yeah. or it's going to slot in between, and it, it's all down to time, really, how much time I've got to do it. So don't expect a Christmas special every year, folks. That's all I'm saying. Only when you're lucky. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and they're, all, they're always good. They tend to be longer, don't they? I know you don't like putting out too long episodes, but your Christmas specials tend to be longer. Yeah, yeah. And you try to do something Christmassy. The one thing about Christmas Christmas games, there, though, is Christmas games tend to be rubbish, don't they? They tend to be rubbish, and I've done them lots of times, and other people have done them lots of times. So unless there's any new games, 
uh, coming out, looking back at the old Christmas games is a bit, you know, it's not w- not really worth it, really, just going over old ground again. Yeah, but there's been some good comments. The so episode 112, you must have done Crash Christmas Edition, because right. a few people commented on that, seemed to like it, like the fact, and said they used to love the Crash cr- Christmas Editions, which I Everyb- did. Everybody loved the Crash, Crash Christmas Editions, the covers were fantastic, and for me, I mean, it, I may be wrong, but I always felt that they were at least twice the size of a normal trash magazine. Normally twice the price as well, but we didn't mind that because it was Christmas. <laughs> Simon Vokins said, What a great treat for Christmas. Something to watch while my wife watches Call the Wimp Midwife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure any of, any of us that are married have been there and done that. Yep, yeah, something we can all sympathise with. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people give their Christmas memories as well, getting their Spectrum for Christmas in the comments which is always I, I really love hearing them I really really love hearing about when people first got their their spectrums there's, there's one comment that I can see from Johan Stein that says Underworld was for me the best ultimate game I'm sorry that I just <laughs> that's wrong isn't it is, is that a mistake well it's funny it's funny that because that was that must have been covered in the Christmas special you must have covered it, ultimate uh, one says great episode is always Underworld was just a crap game <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year Paul and then John pops up and said Underworld for me was the best Chris- Christmas game I think <laughs> I think he'd been at the sherry how can, how can Underworld be the best Christmas game just don't well, it's get not, that. well it's not even a, a good game as far as I'm concerned I'm, I'm so, I know there's going to be a, a storm of comments about that but I, I'm actually when we've mentioned it before in other episodes people have said yes it's it's not the best Someone might think. I mean, maybe it's rose tinted spectacles. Or the, maybe he thinks it's that one where you turn into a wolf every uh, at night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and not the one where you bounce around uncontrollably from screen to screen. Yeah, this one here from Rob Winfer. I love how you wrapped three of those interfaces and cheated on the others. Ah, remember that? Yeah, did that I? Did one. I cheat on them? Sure. I know. I put, I put a few in boxes. I remember that. Yeah, you did. I think you put some in gift boxes. I think you wrapped some in and then put some others in gift boxes or something like that. We'd have well, to they were nice gift boxes, though. We should do director's commentaries where you <laughs> we, we just watch the show and comment on it. As it That's goes. not a bad idea, actually. That's not a bad idea. Comments from 2019 Christmas special, which was its own episode. You you really treated everyone that uh Give a that special year, extra one, yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. A few mi- people mentioned the length of the episode, and I think something happened on YouTube, and I told everyone it was going to be over two hours long. No, if you, only, if you listen, if you listen to the, no, I'll tell you what it is. If you listen to the intro of that show, it says, "I promised I wasn't going to do a two-hour special for Christmas, but here it is anyway." I saw something along those lines. Ah, we all wanted a two-hour-long episode, but <laughs> forty-four minutes fifty-nine seconds. <laughs> Call it, call it 45. Christmas really is about the memories of when you were young, I think, and either getting your Spectrum or getting a really good game for the Spectrum and playing it all over the school holidays, or getting or, a really crap game because uh, your granny got it and just kind of got the latest Ultimate uh, license uh, rip-off, or not Ultimate, Ocean, Ocean or someone else, Elite license rip-off, and you ended up with... I don't know, View to a Kill or something like that. Awesome, Paul. I got Doomstalk's Revenge for Christmas in the 80s and still well, play I knew today. you'd get that in. I knew you'd get a <laughs> <laughs> Lords of Midnight or Doom Dark in oh dear. This is an interesting one. David McGee. Can't believe I got my Spectrum 36 years ago. It wasn't even for Christmas. I just persuaded my dad it would help me with my homework. Yeah, yeah. And bloody hell he fell for it. <laughs> you know what? I bet lots of dads went, oh, yeah. It, went to the mums and said, oh yeah, it'll help with the homework because they wanted to play the games too. And, and like so many people, that he's now a developer, mm. uh, just like myself, who started off on the Spectrum and uh, are now developing uh, is developing, uh, is developing software for a living. And and someone someone always has to get a Commodore um, quote in there as well. It's Christmas time, there's no need to play a Commodore. <laughs> um, but I think that's it for Christmas comments. Okay, always nice to have comments, especially around Christmas. Yep. It's the um, equivalent of a Christmas card. It's a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from me. And me too. Well, there it is, the festive special. Have a great time, relax, enjoy yourself, and see you all in 2023.